Good morning. I'm Tamara Brock, Manager of Partnership Development at Black Health Matters. We're glad you're here with us today. Recently, U.S. health officials gave the final clearance for Pfizer's kid-sized COVID shot. And while the vaccine was tested vigorously and over 3,000 children were monitored, some parents are still very weary of the shot and understandably so. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Peter Hotez and Rochelle Ritchie as they present a very fact-backed information session on COVID-19 and how it affects children. Tamara, thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Rochelle Ritchie, and I'm so excited uh, to be hosting this very important conversation. As Tamara mentioned, there are a lot of questions around COVID-19 in general, but especially when it comes to your children. So I am excited that Dr. Peter Hotez is here uh, to have this very candid and honest and fact-based, as Tamara mentioned, conversation. Uh, Dr. Hotez, you may have seen him pretty much everywhere, I think, uh, on national networks talking about the COVID-19 vaccine and, of course, other uh, diseases that were impacted by in our country. Dr. Hotez is the, I want to get it right, professor of virology and pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, and he is also the co-director of the Texas Children Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. So we have someone here that knows it Oh, Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for joining all of us here this morning. Thanks, Rochelle. It's uh, great to see you and looking forward to talking with you. All right. So let's just jump right into it. Um, first of all, COVID-19. I mean, this pandemic really started to hit uh, the country. Some people believe around 2019, early 2020. And here we are almost into 2022, almost two years later. Um, where do you see this going right now with COVID-19? Are we ever going to be in a, in a place where we don't have to wear masks? We can get on a flight. We can go into restaurants without showing vaccine cards. Where do you think we're going? Yeah, I think, Rochelle, we'll, we'll eventually get out of this, but the bar is high. And, and the bar means that we can vaccinate our way out of it. It's going to be the only way to end this epidemic in the United States and also globally, but it's going to mean 80, 85% of the whole country has to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and not 80, 85% of the adults, 80, 85% of the country. That means pretty much all of the adults and adolescents and a lot of kids will need to be vaccinated, number one. And what fully vaccinated mean is changed. That's gone from two to three doses of the mRNA vaccine and two doses of the J&J &J vaccine. The good news, is I think after that, that may be it. So it, won't, it may not be one and done and two and done, but I think it could be three and done. Some are saying we're going to need boosters every year. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think, you know, given the levels of virus neutralizing antibody and durability I'm seeing coming out of Israel and the UK, that may be it for a while. So this is the key now is to get as many people vaccinated and now kids age 5 to 11 because they're eligible to prevent this next wave and and so this brings us to the next point that um, everyone is kind of high-fiving themselves saying hey now the numbers are coming down maybe that's it this is the that was the last gasp of COVID-19 I don't think that's the case if you notice the numbers are now sort of stuck they've plateaued and now they're starting to go up again just like they did last year so you know last year we saw a big wave in the south in the summer it went down around this time of year then after thanksgiving it shot up again and it was the worst wave of all um in the, in the winter and and i think we're in for something like that again unfortunately so this is why why what we're talking about today is so important to save lives for that next big wave and and I'm starting to see that wave start up in Colorado and Minnesota and in parts of Illinois as well. So it looks like it's, and just like last year, it's going to start taking off again first uh, in the upper Midwest uh, uh, and, and then go on from there. So getting as many people vaccinated to save lives is the big priority. And 
and here for me is the greatest tragedy of all you know you know rochelle since june 1 right when even after vaccines became widely available we lost 150,000 americans between june 1 of this year and now uh, from covid-19 who were unvaccinated so despite the widespread availability of vaccines, 150,000 people, I mean, extraordinary numbers, right? Needlessly lost their lives to COVID-19. All of those lives could have been saved. And um, so this defiance, this refusal to get vaccinated has just become such a killing force in the United States. And so when when you, you and others invited me to come and talk this morning, I, I jumped at the chance because it's an opportunity, I think, to save lives. Because with this next wave, it's going to be the same thing again. It's going to be overwhelmingly the unvaccinated who are going to lose their lives. Yeah. And, you know, before we started this session, I shared with you that, you know, my father actually passed away from COVID-19 September of 2020. He was 57 years old, relatively healthy, didn't drink, didn't smoke, had a black belt in karate. Um, he did have type 1 di diabetes, but his battle with COVID-19 was five months and 29 days. So I am definitely a supporter of people getting vaccinated. Um, and with that said, I can understand how now that we are starting to, uh, now that there's been an approval for children to get vaccinated, when adults have so many questions about their own health, then as a parent, you can only imagine that that, that concern is going to be exacerbated uh, with their children. And we know that from the American Academy of Pediatrics, I just looked this up, that six and a half million children um, have tested positive uh, for COVID as of November 4th. Now, this is obviously going back to the beginning of the pandemic. That's a lot of kids. And as you mentioned, we're about to go into the holidays. It's it's going to be Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, different, you know, whatever your, your faith is, you're celebrating with family and with your um, children that may not be vaccinated. So how do we get parents to feel comfortable? What what do they need to know about this vaccine when it comes to their children and possibly the long-term impact if there is any? Well, first of all, I'm so sorry for your loss. I mean, it must be especially tough on you to see now the vaccines are available and knowing that vaccines would have likely saved your dad's life. And, right. and so I, I just can't imagine what, what you're going through. So my heart goes out to you and your family. With regards to the kids, um, look, I, the you know the narrative that's been put out there, unfortunately, from people who have a political agenda, the, you know the narrative that's out there is, is hey, this is only among old folks. Uh, this kids are going to be fine. They handle this virus well. They don't need to get vaccinated. It's not true. Um, this you know we we've seen uh, across the summer uh, uh, this this summer with the Delta variant, which is so aggressive, right? It just sweeps through unvaccinated populations like a firestorm and just picks up everyone. We've seen thousands and thousands of kids, five to 11, also adolescents who are unvaccinated get hospitalized in our children's hospitals across the South here in Texas, where I am, our Texas Children's Hospital. And for the first time since I can remember, uh, pediatric intensive care units getting overwhelmed. That hadn't happened before. I don't think this Delta variant is necessarily targeting the kids specifically. I just think it it's it just sweeps through unvaccinated populations and can kids get swept up along with it. And so the point is a lot of sick children and, and according to the Centers for Disease Control, I believe the numbers we've had 8,300 kids five to 11 hospitalized and those hospitalized kids are sick about a third of them are in the intensive care unit the pediatric intensive care unit many of them with this uh, unique syndrome that we're seeing in, in younger young adults and kids called multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children misc i don't know who comes up with these acronyms but it's a it's a pretty severe condition so a third are in the icu and the problem is we've seen now about a five-fold increase in these pediatric hospitalizations with this delta wave compared to previous 
variants. So, so the point is, this is not your, you know, your the old fashioned COVID nineteen. This Delta variant is getting a lot of kids sick, and not only in the hospitalizations, we've had about seven hundred deaths of kids, so far greater than, for instance, influenza, and we vaccinated against influenza, which is also important. And we're also now seeing evidence of long COVID in kids. By that, I mean about uh, one in seven, according to a study conducted in London at their big children's hospital there, the Great Ormond Street Hospital of University College London, one in seven, about 14% have symptoms that go on for 15 months or more. And that really concerns me because we have the brains of developing kids the you know the respiratory system the cardiovascular system so we don't know what the full long term impact of covid-19 is going to be in those kids and we see in adults who have long covid many of them have gray matter brain degeneration and cognitive decline we certainly don't want to start seeing that in our kids as well so all of those reasons are you know are so compelling for parents to need to vaccinate their kids and and the good news is that now the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has been approved for five to 11 year olds. It's uh, in the studies that were done over 90% effective uh, at preventing COVID. So it's working really well. And so it's gonna be absolutely critical that parents understand the importance of, of vaccinating their, their young children, their five to 11 year olds. And I want to say to the people that are watching, thank you for joining us. I see your questions. I'm going to get to them as soon as we get through this Q&A section uh, portion with uh, Dr. Hotez. So keep your questions coming and we'll get to them uh, right before the end of our session. So Dr. Hotez, um, what groups of children are at an increase for severe illness uh, from COVID-19? And I'm particularly interested in this question um, as it pertains to the black community. Um, because right when COVID hit, um, I remember uh, writing an op-ed about how this was going to impact black communities uh, gravely because so many of our young children suffer from asthma. Um, I, I spoke with a, um, a scientist who talked about how in some of our neighborhoods and communities where they used to have these, these factories that would pump out all these chemicals, how the chemicals kind of still sit in the air. You think about Cancer Alley uh, in Louisiana. Um, all of these different factors play into how the Black community in particular and our children are impacted. So can you give us um, even more information as to um, the, the health conditions, I guess you could say, of the children that would be most at risk? So the numbers, we're still waiting on all the numbers, but it looks as though uh, African-American kids are at greater risk of hospitalizations. In other words, the hospitalized kids that we've seen across the South have been disproportionately among uh, African-American kids. So they seem to be at somewhat greater risk. We don't have the real numbers though to, to know, to give you a precise number. Now, how much of that are underlying conditions? In other words, is this due to underlying diabetes, type one diabetes, or is it uh, being overweight or even obesity, or is it related to asthma? All the logical questions that everybody would ask, I don't think we really know that. Likely those are factors, but here's the thing I think it's really important. We are seeing healthy kids with no obvious underlying conditions still go to the hospital with COVID-19 and still go to the intensive care unit. So, so I think you don't want to overthink this. You don't want to say, hmm, my kid looks pretty good. He's in good shape, goes outdoors to play no major pediatric health issues, he'll be okay. No, I mean, you want to get those kids vaccinated as well. You know, and one of the things as someone who is, has experienced what it's like to go through a family member uh, dying from COVID-19, I think one of the things that people tend to forget is that most of the time, in many cases, um, you're not allowed to be at the hospital with your loved one if they get sick. And I think the isolation that COVID-19 patients go through um, 
is, is extremely difficult. And I want those that are listening to us um, to understand that that is the reality. This isn't just a regular hospitalization. I mean, I remember going into the ICU unit um, to see my father and I had, it was about two months before I could even get to see him. Um, and, and it looked like I was walking into um, a space a spaceship or something. They they were dressed almost like astronauts in a sense. And there were 17 COVID patients on his floor and people were dying. Um, I mean, it was, it was very, very traumatic. And so I want people to understand that when we're talking about hospitalizations, we're not talking about a, re- this is not a regular hospitalization where you can take flowers up to your loved one and sit there all day with them. That's not the case here. That's not what's happening. I mean, you're literally going to have to talk to a nurse or a doctor or see your loved one on a Zoom call. And good luck if you have a really good connection. Um, if, you know, it's just, it's just, I want people to get the reality of what this is. And I think that's the unfortunate part of how this conversation, these conversations about COVID have been happening, um, particularly in the press, because it's not really giving a real look at what it means to be hospitalized uh, with COVID-19 and what that means for you um, as a family member. And so imagine that for your children. I don't yeah, think yeah. I mean, imagine imagine being in an intensive care unit with COVID nineteen. First of all, you're absolutely right. The the nurses, the docs are all gowned in glove. They have face shields. You can't see their faces. Um, you're surrounded by plastic and machines going off. Um, and you're alone, right? The yeah. the the ability to visit is really compromised because of the safety issue, right? Both to you and to um, and to the other staff, you know, because of because of this virus is so highly contagious. So you're actually seeing these people over a laptop, and you're right with a crummy internet connection, and um, and and you you know more often than not, you you when you pass, you pass alone, right? Or pass holding the hand of a nurse you've never met before and and by the way um it's not only tough on the families the 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 um uh trauma the post traumatic stress among nurses and healthcare professionals has been, has been massive i mean to do this day in and day out we've had enormous numbers of people leaving the health professions because of it's just it was just too much and um so you're absolutely right so if your child is unfortunate enough to be hospitalized or especially if in the pediatric intensive care unit with COVID-19, more more likely than not, you will not be able to comfort them and your child will be terrified. There's just no way around it. And so this is all avoidable, right? So this is the message that we don't have to go through this. We've got safe and effective uh, vaccines for COVID-19, but we do have this problem where the surveys coming out of the Kaiser Family Foundation show only about one in three parents so far are willing to vaccinate their kids. And uh, and I think that's really important to, to go forward and, and do that and take that step. And by the way, you know, you don't have to take our word for it. Talk, you have an expert in your neighborhood. Talk to your pediatrician. Talk to your family's pediatrician. They're they get on i mean I, I was trained as a pediatrician as well in addition to being a scientist you get enormous amount of training about vaccines how to deliver vaccines how they work your pediatrician's an expert talk to them have that conversation and move forward and get get them vaccinated because i'll tell you it's it's going to start up again especially um, around the Thanksgiving holidays and go it's just like last year that's exactly what happened and whether it's because of people getting together on Thanksgiving or in spite of it I don't think we re- realize it but that's another point you know your kid you know if you have a Thanksgiving celebration your child's going to be surrounded by a lot of family members they may or may not be fully vaccinated and and there's there's risk there in addition to the risk of getting it in school so this is why it's really critically important And I also want you, Dr. Hotes, to tap into, and then I'm going to get to some of the questions in the chat. I also want you to tap into the fact that it's not just about 
protecting um, your child, but it's also about protecting other people that might be around your child that are vulnerable. I mean, when I think about the reason why I got the vaccine, not only because of my father's death from COVID-19, but also because I didn't want to be responsible for getting someone else sick. And now as a vaccinated person, I do realize I can still get COVID-19. The, the likeliness of me being hospitalized or dying is lessened, but I can still get the virus. Just like if I get a flu vaccine, I can still get the flu. But the problem is, is that if I'm around people that are unvaccinated and, I'm, and I have no symptoms, um, I would feel awful to be responsible for giving someone um, a virus that I probably didn't even know um, that I had and that I'm able to just feel, you know, perfectly fine about it. So can you talk a little bit about why it's important to get vaccinated outside, vaccinating your children outside of just protecting them? Yeah, a couple, so you brought up a lot of important points. First of all, the good news is it's looking like if you get that third immunization, that booster, it tends to restore the ability of the vaccine to halt infection as well as illness so you know it, i know we've go, gone sort of seesaw on this a bit so when the vaccines first came out they were supposed to stop symptomatic illness and hospitalization but it wouldn't stop infection but then data from israel showed that it actually is stopping an infection as well so we got very excited by that but then with the waning of immunity after two doses after six months then we lost that piece and so you were still vulnerable to infection now once again, if you get that third immunization, it's looking like it may stop infection once again. So and that's why I say in terms of getting the country out of this mess in terms of not having to wear masks anymore and f feeling like we lived in 2019, the key to that is to get fully vaccinated with three doses. And I think that's where we have to, that should be our aspirational goal. With regards to kids, you're absolutely right. Kids can transmit this virus if they're unvaccinated, both to themselves, to other kids in the school, as well as to teachers in the school, as well as bring it home to parents and grandparents. Um, so it, they are important for stopping transmission. But one of the points that I like to make is this, you know, the anti-vaccine people are very clever, right? And one of the things that they say is the only reason they're telling you to vaccinate their kids is to they're being used to for this fantasy to stop the the epidemic and it's not really benefiting the kids that's false it's um the, the re first and foremost reason these vaccines were approved for kids is to benefit the kids so you remember you're vaccinated you're not vaccinating them for some abstract concept you're vaccinating your kids to save your kids life and to prevent them from getting long COVID. so i think that's really really important to, to make that point Wonderful. All right, Dr. Hotez, I want to get to some of the questions because um, I know people are anxious, anxiously waiting for me to ask their questions. So the first one is how many people have died who were vaccinated? So right now it looks so we, you know, it, we have these various numbers by state so far. For instance, uh, we just got the numbers out of Texas for 2021, 85% of the deaths were among unvaccinated individuals. So the overwhelming majority were unvaccinated. Of, of the 15% who were vaccinated um, but still lost their life, half of those only got a single dose of vaccine, so they were only partially vaccinated. So the number of people who lose their life from COVID-19 who are fully vaccinated is quite small, uh, just a few percentage points. Now, having said that, we are seeing waning immunity with two doses. So those numbers will come up. So that's why it's so important to get the third immunization. But overwhelmingly, this is an, uh, uh, both an epide epidemic and deaths resulting from the unvaccinated. So if you're not, not vaccinated, you have a 40 times higher risk, at least in Texas, of, of dying. And those numbers are pretty much panning out nationally. So you absolutely want to get vaccinated to save your life. And next question, what percentage of youth aged 12 to 16 
have already received the vaccination. So this person is looking for ages 12 to 16. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of regional variation. So if you look up in um, the New England states, the Northeast, you know, 75, 80% of the 12 to 17 year olds are vaccinated. So doing a really good job. But down here in the South, it's it's a mess. It's, you know, in some counties, 20% of the those teenagers are vaccinated, 30%. So between 20 and 40%. So half and sometimes less in terms of the South compared to the North, in part because of the all the anti-vaccine aggression that's that's down here. So it varies uh, tremendously by region. So among the older Americans, the difference, the differential between the North and the South, not that great, but it's among young people, especially the adolescents, where the big change is. And that's why it's, and I, my worry is that the same parents who are not vaccinating their kids in the so adolescents in the South the 12 to 17 year olds probably are not going to vaccinate their younger kids as well. And we need to reach them. Okay. And now um, someone is asking, what is the forecast for children under five years old and the need for vaccinations? I think there will, I think it will be important to do that. Um, but we don't have those studies yet. Um, possibly by the end of the year, early next year, um, we'll have more information about that. So there are studies being done, including here at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, doing uh, trials on Moderna, Pfizer, other vaccines for younger kids. But uh, I don't expect that's going to happen right away. And this question um, kind of goes back to our discussion about the realities of being hospitalized. Um, someone asked, why can't you visit someone in the hospital if you've already had it, it being COVID-19 um, yourself. I'll let you you take that and then I'll just give a brief um, what my experience was like personally. Well, you know, the problem with infection um, and recovery is that your immunity is incomplete. Um, some people have really strong protective immunity, others very little or none, and you don't know where you fall in that. So that's why the recommendation is even if you've been infected and recovered, you still want to get vaccinated. And that gives you pretty strong, durable protection. It also gives you something called epitope broadening, where you're actually res more resistant, more resilient to variants. So so the, the protection afforded by um, infection and recovery is incomplete. Yeah, and um, that kind of goes into the the next question about can you get reinfected? I can answer that and just say yes. Um, very simply, yes, you can get um, reinfected. But um, to the person, especially that with the Delta variant, that's so highly yeah. transmissible. Um, but to the person that said, why can't you visit someone in the, in the hospital? At the time that my father went into the hospital in April of 2020, um, obviously that was very early on. Um, and the hospitals were trying to basically control um, people getting infected and kind of taking it from the hospital and then spreading it to their families. Um, but I had to literally fight um, with the hospital to be able to get up and be uh, by my father's side. And even then it was only limited to um, two people that could visit him, myself and my aunt. And um, I had to pretty much agree not to, to sue if I got sick or you know anything like that because I was putting myself at risk by going onto the COVID floor um, every single day. And so that was part of the reason um, why it was so difficult to get into the hospitals. Luckily for me and my family, um, we were able to be there with him in his last moments of life. Um, and I'm grateful for that. But keep in mind, that is very, very rare. Uh, there are a lot of families that are not getting that. And it is an awful, awful feeling. So and, um, and just remember, we don't have to go there, right? I mean, we can stop this now by getting vaccinated. Exactly. And that's, that's got to be the most important message of all. Yeah. Um, and someone asked, and we kind of touched on this earlier, are African Americans at higher risk for COVID-19? Um, certainly what we've seen in the younger kids, um, it looks like somewhat higher. Yes. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, um, the numbers among adults showed that both Hispanic and African-American populations were at uh, especially high risk. 
how much of that was due to the fact that um, they were in some cases living in low income neighborhoods where they had essential work and they had to, they, you know, they weren't working at home by Zoom and Skype. They had to be out out and about. And so they had greater exposure and also multi-generational homes so that, you know, the 22-year-olds working on a construction site's coming home and, you know, exposing mom and grandma. I mean, a lot of that was happening as well. I think some of that is, is evened out, but it's still... Um, you know, you uh, what we're seeing in the kids, it's still it's still quite quite a bit higher. It looks like among BIPOC kids compared to um, uh, other groups. Yeah, and then um, a lot, the last question that we have right now in the Q and A is: How important is a booster shot, and do you anticipate having to get them yearly, similar to the flu shot? Yeah, as, as as we mentioned, um, I think the third immunization of the mRNA and the second of the J and J is really important. You know, I've said since the beginning it's a three dose vaccine for Pfizer and Moderna, and J and J is always a two dose vaccine. The problem was it wasn't really messaged that way, and so I think that caused a lot of confusion. So I think that's really important, just because we gave those first two doses so close together, and when you do that, you don't. It was necessary to protect as many of the healthcare providers and nursing home residents as possible. Um, but then when you do that, it doesn't create a durable immune response. So that's why you need to give that third immunization after six months. It's really what the same we do for most pediatric vaccines. If you look at the schedule of uh, what, the way we vaccinate infants, we give them a series of immunizations, bang, 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 then we stop, we pause for six months to a year, and then we boost. And then that gives you long, much longer lasting protection for years um, at, at a time. So you don't have to get a booster for another five or 10 years. And pretty much the mRNA vaccines are going by that same playbook. So both predicted and predictable. And then I do not think we're going to need yearly boosters after that. Now, I may be wrong because it's a new, new technology vaccine. But if it goes by the same playbook as the other vaccines, that may be it for a while. And I heard you mention Moderna and Johnson and Johnson um, as far as like the boosters, but not Pfizer. So can you, is, is no, Pfizer Pfizer's a spe Pfizer's especially important to boost because um, after two doses, that seems to be show the greatest decline in oh. protection is the Pfizer, but then the third immunization. So I had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. I got my third immunization and now the levels of virus neutralizing antibodies should go up 30 to 40 fold and then should stay up for a while. So it was a three dose vaccine. It's an excellent vaccine. Okay. Got it. Cause I have Pfizer. So that lets me know I need to go get, um, get um booster. my booster. I think it'll um, be approved for, I think it'll be approved for, um, uh, universally for three immunizations pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. And then someone popped in another question. Is there any truth? And, you know, we've heard these, these rumors. Is there any truth to the rumor of sterilization among men who get the vaccine? The answer is no. Um, remember where that rumor came from. The rumor came from the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer. So the anti-vaccine groups made up that story. They said the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer, or other cancers causes infertility. It was never the case. And but it worked for them in this pyrrhic sense that it scared people off. And so when they said, hey, that works. So they copy pasted that false assertion on the COVID-19 vaccines. So if you notice a lot of the fake assertions about COVID-19 vaccines, you know, as someone who's gone up against anti-vaccine groups for many years, because I have a daughter, my youngest daughter has autism and intellectual disabilities. And I wrote a book a few years ago called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which made me kind of public enemy number one. There's no fake assertion I haven't seen before. And, and more often than not, they just copy paste it onto the COVID-19 vaccines. Yeah. And I think that, you know, especially in the, um, the African-American community, a lot of times we hear about um, the Tuskegee uh, yeah, well, well, you should be aware that what's going around now is this horrible, they call it a documentary. It's not a documentary. It's, it basically, what it does is it shows, you know, uh, people of color getting their Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. 
and then it switches to grainy images from the 50s and 60s of Tuskegee experimentation and tries to equate the it two. It's, it's about as exploitative and I think racist as you can imagine, but yeah. this is what's going on now. So black communities are being targeted by anti-vaccine messages. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things where there's been a lot of misinformation on what happened, what Tuskegee, it wasn't that they were injected with syphilis, it's that they were not being treated for it. And that was a dis the, the, the issue, but we could go on and on um, about that. Um, I'm gonna take one more question before we wrap this up because um, I am over time, but uh, I wanna get this in. Um, one person said, my concern with uh, getting the vaccine was the unknown long-term effects, especially for my kids. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, we've had these vaccines now around for um, well over a year. So in, in that time, millions and millions of people have, have gotten um, immunized. So we know it a lot. And we do know there is a rare complication, and that's how sensitive our system of pharmacovigilance is. It's known as myocarditis, inflammation of the heart. It occurs in about one in 10,000 adult males between the ages of 16 to 29. Some feel it actually goes down among the adolescents. We don't have that rate among the younger kids, but remember there's less mRNA in the vaccine. So I'm hopeful that the rate will be even lower uh, among five to 11 year olds. So it's a rare complication. We know about it, we know how to look for it. Um, at, but remember what COVID-19 does, it's landed thousands and thousands of kids in the hospital, a third of them in the intensive care unit with, with the virus itself causing myocarditis, the virus itself causing thrombotic complications and stroke and, and, uh, and causing um, myocardial infarction and causing pulmonary insufficiency and long COVID and neurologic effects. So if you're worried about the long-term consequences, the effort to focus on the long-term consequences of getting COVID-19, the virus, because that we know about. Well, Dr. Hotez, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this very, very, very important conversation. Thank you everyone um, for your very important questions and your compliments and your condolences for my father, all of those things. Um, but we're gonna wrap this up. So thank you again, um, Dr. Peter Hotez uh, for sharing all of this wonderful and necessary information with us this morning. Well, thank you, Rochelle. It's really great to work with you, and I hope we have the opportunity to do this again sometime because there's some important messages here. Absolutely. Thank you so much.